Good morning. I'm pleased to welcome all of you to what is now the 27th leading economics institute conference on the state of the U.S. and the world economies. I would have said annual, but in fact, I think we missed one year. This is the last year that I will have to transmit to you the apology of the president of the institute for his absence. I'm pleased to announce that Dimitri will be returning to us very soon, and hopefully for next year's conference he will be able to make the introductory statement, and I will then not have to do it. In the meantime, he does send his best wishes. In fact, he will be arriving, I think, the day after tomorrow. Uh, and he hopes that we have, in the tradition of the Levy Conference, a lively and open-ended discussion. To that end, I prepare, as Dimitri always has done, an introductory statement to try and generate a bit of interest in current conditions, which really now probably is not necessary because the political atmosphere in which we are meeting is probably characterized in the most endemic economic policy uncertainty that has been seen for some time, aggravated by perhaps even greater differences between the policies of the administration and the preferences of the congressional majority. However, this year, instead of unknown unknowns, to coin a phrase, we have the experience of congressional approval of a series of known concrete measures on taxation and budget spending, the implementation and impact of which, number them, but nonetheless, remain largely unknown. We also have much clearer indications of likely measures in the area of trade and financial regulation than we had last year. While some resemble policy measures implemented by past Republican administrations, some challenge traditional party orthodoxy, and it is there in which the uncertainty arises. It is hard to find a Republican administration that has not introduced measures to reduce taxes on the promise that they would pay for themselves. And I will suggest the historical antecedent for this belief in a moment. When this promise is disappointed by increasing fiscal deficits, the response has usually been a call for a reduction in spending and legislation to balance the budget, eventually leading to modification or even a reversal of the taxation measures. Recall the experience of the Reagan administration and the subsequent episode of the misreading of lips. The current administration differs only in that it has not waited for the tax reduction measures to increase the deficit. It has moved to accelerate this result by a direct increase in net spending embodied in the omnibus expenditure resolution. And true to form, the balanced budget amendment has already come before Congress without issue. And there are rumors circulating that some of the provisions in the omnibus bill may end up, so to speak, under the bus. Speaker Ryan, who has been the most strident voice in arguing that deficits can be ignored because they can be easily eliminated by the necessary incisions in entitlement spending, appears to have decided to leave the building rather than take up that perennial fight. But he has agreed to stay on to fight for means testing, drug testing, and food baskets in pending agricultural legislation which is where the issue of food security paradoxically <coughs> still resides. It thus seems clear that we will have a repeat of the cycle in which Republican policymakers manage their cognitive dissonance and embrace balanced budget amendments while at the same time lamenting the profligacy of the poor in driving the increase in the deficit as a result of entitlements. Current conditions are thus likely to reinforce the Cheney rule. Reagan proved that deficits don't matter and highlight the fact that the point at issue is not the fiscal deficits and the size of the government debt, but rather entitlement spending on non-productive activities. We may expect to see a revival of the welfare queens as well as adult entertainers on the horizon. It is paradoxical that the part of the population most in need of government support provides the electoral base for those who propose politics to eliminate it. This suggests that while the theoretical case for managing fiscal policy to provide economic stabilization is secure, politically, deficits are probably a non-issue. Given the failure of Congress to manage its budgets economically, monetary policy has become the sole tool of economic stabilization. While tight monetary restraint has been the traditional antidote to rising deficits, the persistent failure of unconventional monetary measures introduced after the Great Recession and the associated contortions of the Phillips curve 
has made such policy increasingly problematic. After serving as the asset price support policy of last resort in recovery from the Great Recession, the Fed has become increasingly irrelevant as the length of the recovery achieves historical dimensions. Indeed, in the current administration, monetary policy seems to have reversed its traditional role. The measure of success of the Federal Reserve is no longer controlling the rate of inflation, but rather in promoting increasing equity prices. The new chairman seems determined to continue to edge interest rates slowly upwards, channeling Alan Greenspan's belief that it is impossible to identify an asset bubble until it has already collapsed. What seems to have been forgotten in this context is Greenspan's surprise at the bond market's over a half trillion dollar collapse in reaction to his reversal of interest rate policy in the beginning of 1994. This is perhaps the best guide to the market response to rising rates. And things may be even more dramatic if, as will be suggested tomorrow, the outstanding debt of private non-financial corporations is an order of magnitude higher than reported in official statistics. The enthusiasm with which the administration views equity prices as confirmation of the success of its policies and the equanimity of the Fed on equity prices can only be explained by the belief that it is the prospect of a $1 trillion government debt rather than a bond or stock market break which is the greatest threat to financial stability. Somewhat paradoxically, it seems that it is the proposed remedies for the current account deficit that have greater impact on the behavior of the market than monetary policy. Indeed, the market response to the proposed introduction of tariff measures seems somewhat irrational, for it appears that the policy will result in a resuscitation of an old friend, the VER, rather than the imposition of actual tariffs on trade. For those of you who don't remember the experience of voluntary export restraints when Japan was making America poor by stealing automobile jobs and outpacing our consumer electronics industry, anyone here still have a Sony Walkman? <laughs> Academic assessments concluded that VERs in fact increase prices and profits for both exporters and importers, with the consumer bearing the burden. In the end, it was not the VERs, but the Yen Shaku that drove Japanese producers to set up production facilities in the US and the rest of Southeast Asia, and which provided the impetus for the geographical distribution of production facilities that created the global supply chains that we now call globalization. Against this background of extreme policy uncertainty and an increasingly tight monetary policy in the presence of what appears to be a massively overvalued stock market, and historically low unemployment, it is surprising that analysts are not focused on when the current recovery will stumble and what policies remain to respond to even a mild recession. There seems to be some flexibility remaining in rising participation rates in the labor market, but as Herb Stein has famously remarked, everything that must come to an end. While it is obvious that history never repeats itself, it has an uncanny ability to rely on past policies to try to deal with new problems. Consider the political context of the transition to peace faced in 1918. The IWW had initiated, for those of you who don't remember the IWW, these are the Hawaiians, had initiated a series of strikes in 1917, followed by the Bolshevik Revolution and the creation of the US Communist Party and Labor Union what came to be known at that time as the Red Scare, suggesting a preamble to socialist revolutions which were already occurring in Hungary and Germany. Recognizing potential for political unrest that could be created by widespread unemployment as some four million soldiers returned to meet some nine million workers being displaced from the war effort, Woodrow Wilson noted, and I quote, the ordinary and normal processes of private initiative will not, however, provide immediate employment for all of the men of our returning armies. Those who are of trained capacity will find no difficulty, it is safe to say, in finding place and employment. But there will be others who will be at a loss where to gain a livelihood unless pains are taken to guide them and put them in the way of work. There will be a large floating residuum of labor which should not be left wholly to shift for itself. It seems to me important, therefore, that the development of public works of every sort should be promptly resumed in order that opportunities <coughs> should be created for unskilled labor in particular, and that plans should be made for such developments of our unused lands and our natural resources, as we have hitherto lacked stimulation to undertake. 
this Herbert Hoover eventually who was to design those plans in the subsequent administration and then failed to adequately use them. Wilson's suggestion for public works was quickly taken up by Walter Weil, who proposed a policy of buffer employment, by which he meant employment which absorbs the stock and jar, shock and jar of bad times, employment which quietly takes on men at a time when otherwise they would be tramping in the streets looking for jobs and releases them as soon as they are able to find other work at better wages. It is a method devised to lessen unemployment. The greater the impending unemployment, the greater the necessity for a well-planned system of buffer jobs. William Hard, who while credited with the original idea of big jobs for bad times, which he had proposed in the impending recession, which everybody thought would occur in 1914 and 1915, followed by raising the question of how to provide popular support amongst the working class for a reconstruction of business, rather than a more radical political solution. And here I quote, if private enterprise cannot supply the work, then the state must. We did not stint our resources when the problem was one of destroying the alien enemies of democracy. Uncertainty as to tomorrow's bread in sanitary living quarters, the undernourishment of children, education rendered ineffective our enemies of democracy as the Kaiser ever was. The question Hart was raising was whether popular support could be assured for a restoration of the pre-war capitalism of big business and trusts without ensuring a guarantee that working men and women would participate in the benefits. His concerns were prescient, as in the two years following the armistice, some 25 major racial disorders erupted as returning soldiers found jobs filled by the emigration of blacks to the industrial north and the IWW called its famous Seattle strike. Britain was also beset by race riots and labor unrest in this period. While today we recognize the benefit of employer blast schemes championed by Hyman Minsky on the merits of financial stability and macroeconomic stabilization, in the 1920s these programs were seen as providing institutional stability a response to more radical solutions than in circulation. And this morning we will have a session dealing with a modern proposal for these buffer employment schemes. But in 1918, these proposals lacked resonance, <coughs> for instead of the anticipated post-war recession, the go sustained government fiscal and monetary stimulus, along with strong export demand, provided employment growth, rapidly rising prices, and the initiation of the Florida real estate boom. In fact, I had written bubble. However, as a result of the introduction of tighter monetary policy, rising taxes, and reduced government spending, a fiscal surplus, declining exports, and falling agricultural prices, the boom began to collapse in 1920. And by 1921, ended in the most violent crashes of prices that the nation has ever, had ever experienced to that time. The index of wholesale prices of all commodities fell from 227 in 1922 to 150 in 1921. Retail prices fell between 12 and 13 percent in the two years, and industrial production from a low, low point in 1921 in the second quarter of that year was only 2 percent higher than in 1914. It is estimated that in 1921 there were 4,754,000 people out of work. This was only a guess because we had to wait for Herbert Hoover to in fact institute a statistical measurement of unemployment. At that stage people still really did not care. The crash brought about more than 100,000 bankruptcies. Before the reckoning was finally complete, 453,000 farmers had lost their farms. It is interesting to note the importance of this experience to the development of Hayek's malinvestment theory of the cycle, for he was a visitor to the US during this period. The correction was sharp and short and laid the way for the sustained expansion for the rest of the decade. It also provided the support for Secretary of the Treasury Mellon's subsequent advice to Herbert Hoover, liquidate labor, liquidate stocks, liquidate the farmer, and liquidate real estate, and the recovery will naturally follow, as he believed it had done in 1921. In 1920, in the early stages of the recession, the Republican administration was elected under the call by Warren Harding for a return to normalcy which for candidate Harding meant less government in business and more business in government. Normalcy was a catchphrase to forget the political and economic problems of the war and return to pre-war conditions. For Harding, this meant that rather than the threat of political instability due to unemployment and 
again, I quote, there's not a menace in the world today like that of growing public indebtedness and mounting public <coughs> expenditures. An interesting idea when we recall that one of the first measures of the new administration was legislation against lynching. In the face of the developing collapse, the economic policy of normalcy involved both substantial reductions in tax rates proposed by Secretary Mellon, as well as an increase in tariffs. These last two items are of special interest. The first because the recovery represents the justification for the Republican position that tax cuts pay for themselves. The top marginal rate, which had been increased after the war, was reduced in stages from 73% in 1921 to 25% in 1925, and the federal deficit fell by half. The unemployment rate that Weil and Hard were so worried about and had peaked at 12% on their measurements was to fall to just over 3%. While this rendition of events happily ignores the impact of technology on consumption and investment in the period, it also ignores two other factors. The first is that despite the Cato Institute's claim to the contrary, conveniently forgetting the Federal Highway Act, the knock-on to consumption of expanding ownership of automobiles, electrification and radio, and the beginning of commercial aviation, amongst other contributors to the age of mass production and consumption, the Mellon tax cuts did not lift all boats equally. The share of fiscal income of the top 10% of the income distribution increased from 44% to roughly a 50% share, equivalent to that recorded in the United States in 2015. Despite the roaring success of normalcy, the Florida real estate bubble collapsed in 1925, and collapsing commodity prices led to disparation in the farm sector, with the result that although the stock market was booming, the financial system recorded rising numbers of bank failures topping at nearly 1,000 in 1926, the mainly small local banks that suffered from the depression in agricultural prices and the collapse of the post-war real estate boom. Finally, the approval of the Ford and Becomer Tariff Act, which replaced the 1921 emergency tariff and produced an average tariff of nearly 50% on most dutiable goods, created an international disruption that made war reparations more difficult and contributed to the flows of capital from the US to Europe which was used to meet reparations and laid the groundwork for the collapse of the European banking system in 1931. Given the need of indebted countries to run trade surpluses to meet debt service, the tariffs were met with widespread and targeted retaliation. Does it sound familiar? In particular, on automobiles. This is, of course, the context of Keynes' economic consequences of the peace and the discussion with Olin of the transfer problem. Thus, the policies so far introduced by the current administration appear to follow the Harding Mellon playbook on taxation and trade policy. Curiously, there are a number of other similarities. Although Trump cannot be accused of a return to normalcy, in terms of new technologies, the period was certainly destructive, if not disruptive. The current policy of energy dominance brings to mind the Teapot Dome scandal and the first conviction of a sitting cabinet minister. Harding also had difficulties with his cabinet choices and a penchant for appointing relatives to government positions. Major scandals erupted in the Department of the Interior, the Veterans Bureau, the activities of the Attorney General, and even touched the head of the Federal Reserve, who was subsequently indicted for fraud. And then there was the problem of his mistresses and an inability to control the public airing of his extramarital affairs. As to the social impact, George Sewell, who was a chronicle of the chronicler of the period, notes the Ku Klux Klan for a time built a tremendous organization on the aimless unrest foreshadowing the Nazi movement in Germany by mobilizing his hostility against Jews, Negroes, and Catholics. Technology produced countless new gadgets in increasing numbers while it added to the insecurity of employment. It would appear that there is little difference in the basic economic and social policies employed by the return to normalcy and the recent introduction of economic nationalism to make America first. Last year's introduction to this conference drew a parallel between the New Deal policies to respond to the needs of the forgotten man who had lost self-confidence and who had given up the ability of government to remedy his distress, noting that Trump had channeled this approach, appealing to those eventually de described by the Democratic candidate as deplorables Marx would have said lumpen proletariat, Kant would have called them rabbles, or in the French Revolution they would have been the saint culottes. 
who believe that they have been passed over by changes in technology and global supply chains, with their jobs taken by immigrants or foreigners, and playing on the belief that government had abandoned them in favor of globalist elites more interested in regulations to defend disappearing frog species and watercourses that close mines, or to impose the right to eat cake and use bathrooms at will. Thus, instead of restoring confidence in the ability of government to remedy and support, this resentment has been channeled to the coastal elites in the government, immigrants, foreign competition, more or less in that order. Instead of presenting the government as the savior, the government has become a swamp-infested enemy. Whereas Roosevelt provided policies that restored confidence in the ability of government to support the forgotten man by charging it to play a more direct role in the economy and relied on experimentation to find out what worked, the current administration has responded to the plight of the excluded as an excuse to follow traditional Republican policies of tax cuts and expenditure policies that will have little impact in improving conditions in mining or manufacturing or other sectors where employment is currently under threat. Nor will the trade measures provide direct support. While rants against immigrants and elites provide support to the resentment felt at the abandonment by government, they do little to improve the conditions that have produced support for restoring coal, draining the swamp, and building the wall. Comparison with the Wilson and Roosevelt policy suggests that it is only by providing more direct governmental measures of support to the marginalized population can we provide political stability. Following the traditional Republican mantra of reducing the size of government and the scale of social entitlements seems in direct contradiction to the promises that have been made. Future policies will depend on the pressure to reverse this strategy and to restore these policies as well as determining the political evolution that it will generate. Whether Republicans or Democrats respond with direct measures cannot be foreseen. What can be foreseen is the possibility that the evolution of AI and robotics will expand the ranks of the deplorables. The response that is currently on offer is universal basic income. One proponent when asked if this would not run counter to the need to contain government deficits, it was responded that the deficits would in fact be negligible since prices would fall substantially. Given that the current administration cannot engineer policy that expands entitlements for the deplorables, it seems unlikely that any future administration would be willing or able to do so in order to offset the impact of AI and robotics. But this is not the major problem, which will be the ownership of low-maintenance, non-labor means of production and the financial conditions for their creation. As Minsky insisted, capitalism is a system in which the control over the means of production, whether it's machines or robots, takes place by borrowing. What raises the question of how these debts will be validated, and if there is no debt, how profits will be supported? These basic questions that fall under the rubric of Minsky's concern for financial fragility, or perhaps money manager capitalism, will soon be replaced by robot capitalism. Our conference panels and speakers will address a number of these issues, starting with the short-term outlook and then evaluating the possibility of a modern buffer employment scheme along the lines proposed by Herman Minsky. We will also investigate monetary and trade policies, as well as the underworld of debt accumulation on a national and global scale as an indication of the underlying financial fragility that may be unleashed by this policy volatility. As you are all aware, there is a Minsky cycle that pervades the profession which is to forget about him in the good times and trot him out when the crash comes, pretending that you really saw it coming all along. One of the major objectives of the Levy Institute is to keep thinking about Minsky in good times, because that is when he is relevant and measures can be taken to remedy fragility. After the crisis breaks, not so much. It is interesting that the retiring head of the PBOC, Zhao Zhuashuan, has recently tried to alert policymakers in China to the importance of Minsky and to think about him before the crisis. As in past years, we invite you to take a look at our website or take with you some of our publications that are available at the back of the room and would very much welcome your comments. In addition, in closing, I would like to draw your attention to the Institute's graduate programs in economic theory and policy. Next year, our two-year Master of Science will be complemented with a one-year Master of Arts. We encourage you to bring it to the attention of any students interested in the alternative approach to economic theory and policy offered on the basis of the work of Hyman Minsky and Bill Godley that we offer here at the Institute. So finally, I welcome you. You can look forward next year to Dimitri offering you a slightly different introduction.
I hope you will enjoy the conference. We hope you will find the presentations and discussions thoughtful. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.